And this is the problem that has been systematically ignored by Darwinian biology, although it's beginning to come into prominence now with the claims of the complexity organizers and so on, that maybe they can find some principle that organizes greater uh, complexity. Now, when you understand that, that the problem is the information, the problem is the complexity, uh, then you realize that things such as, for example, the growth of molecular evolution studies are very anti-Darwinian. Now, it's true that by comparing molecular sequences, you can make what are called molecular phylogenies. Exactly what those mean is very much in dispute because they're different for different molecules, and uh, the, the data is very heavily uh, 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 and carefully uh, interpreted and changed uh, often in the growth of them. But you can make patterns of relationship uh, very well. But what the molecular studies also show us is that the complexity which we've always seen at the visible level in organisms is replicated at the molecular level. You add new and new and new levels of complexity. So that even the simplest form of vision, for example, requires a vast network of complicated molecular components that all have to work together to set it in motion. And no effort is being made to solve those problems. Molecular evolution means charting molecular relationships. It does not mean explaining how the complex varieties of molecular systems can come about because the problem just gets more and more difficult uh, all the time. We talk about recent fossils and how things are related. Yes, you can make a pattern of relationship. You can say some things are more like certain things than like others, but where are the patterns of ancestors and ancestral descent? Where is the step-by-step -step progression from one thing to another, especially in the big divisions, the phyla that I showed you there in the hard facts wall, uh, where it ought to exist? It's totally absent. Now, the notion that Darwinism is a theory of particular variations within types that are already existing, that has been arbitrarily expanded into a, a theory of general biological creation and innovation, this is not a notion which I invented out of some religious bias or, or whatever. It's, in fact, what the most sophisticated Darwinists have seen all along. It's what Stephen Jay Gould said when he wrote in 1980 that the synthesis as a general theory is effectively dead, despite its prevalence as textbook orthodoxy. It doesn't fit the evidence. Um, change doesn't seem to occur in that way. The proof that mutations of a complexity building type arrive regularly and in great quantity and on schedule to build new complex organs isn't there. That's why the stories of wing evolution and so on are called derisively just so stories, because they're naturalistic fables put in scientific language, but without the scientific backing to show that they really existed. Now, again, I do not set as my goal in a talk like that convincing people in the audience who may be convinced of, of a, 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 uh, the opposing point of view to change their minds overnight. I don't think that's the way that change happens. What I want to convince you of is this. The people who doubt the truths of Darwinian evolution, who doubt that accumulation of micromutations through natural selection can build complex plants and animals from single-celled predecessors, who doubt that anybody knows how the specific human qualities of consciousness and intelligent purpose could have arisen. These are people who doubt for valid scientific reasons based on the evidence. And what has been going on in the past century is a steamroller. And you get the tone of the steamroller in the way that Will argues, uh, uh, friendly though he is, uh, <laughs> that the purpose, the purpose is to overwhelm the dissent. And I want you to understand that that won't work. More and more details are coming out, more and more of the new research in embryology, in uh, molecular evolution is simply generating more problems, and it's recognized by the most uh, far-sighted people in the theory. This is going, we're going to have to come to grips with this, and I believe that as soon as we can get the debate open in the universities and out on the table, the kind of evolution that Will Provine is preaching is going to collapse, not because people like me are going to do it, but because the scientists themselves uh, will see that they, they can't go on with it. Over to you. Yes, and, and now Professor Provine's rebuttal. Between evolutionists in the field, 
He argues that evolutionary biology is in a crisis. There's no crisis whatsoever in the field of evolutionary biology with regard to the question of evolution by descent. Evolution by descent is agreed upon everywhere among both biologists in general and certainly by evolutionary biologists. You simply see no descent there whatsoever. But Phil conflates evolution by descent with the mechanisms of the evolutionary process. Darwin believed they were separable issues and I believe they're quite separable as well. On the question of evolution by descent, there is very strong evidence indeed for evolution by descent. This does not mean that there's a complete fossil record or something like that. But what we can do is look at the evidence that we do have for evolution by descent and make very reasonable conclusions that the entire process was an evolution by descent leaving aside whether it's purposive, whether it's guided by God, or anything else. So the question comes down to naturalism versus supernaturalism. If you start from a supernaturalistic point of view and you study modern science, I started from supernaturalism. I studied modern science, and that's what turned me into a naturalist. It's not as if I didn't give full consideration to the problem of supernaturalism. I clung to supernaturalism because I wanted for it to be true. But in studying evolutionary biology, I found I simply couldn't hold to my beliefs because the evidences for naturalism were too great. So to me, the size of the leap of faith that is required to believe in naturalism is small. Phil tells you it's very large indeed, and I guess for him, it's only a small leap of faith to believe in a, ben in a benevolent God who answers prayers, who gives all these other things. And that's just a little leap of faith. To me, that's a giant leap of faith compared with believing in naturalism. But I'd like to hear from this audience. I'd like to hear from you on the count of three. How many of you believe all animals and plants were created by God within the last 10,000 years? One, two. All right, let's keep going. That's good. Belief in this audience. Evolution occurred over very long time periods, but God guided this process. Let's hear it. One, two, three. Whoa, evolutionary theists are few and far between. Belief in this audience. Evolution occurred over three and one half billion years and by totally natural processes. One, two, three. <laughs> Young Earth creationists win that poll. I thought I would discuss Phil's views on mechanisms of evolution. But unfortunately, he said not one word about it. And if you ask him questions about it, that's exactly what you will get in response is blank, 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 and blank. I've already said that. I thought Phil's critique of the Science Museum was terrific. Only he just didn't go far enough because those exhibits, many of them, are much worse than he knows. I went to the one at the Royal Ontario Museum, and that that showed the mollusks evolving one time right up to and then it had a, showed a bunch of modern mollusks. Well, the mollusk expert I know the best, Arthur J. Kane from the University of Liverpool, claims that he's got abundant morphological evidence that they have evolved independently at least five times around the world. So the ROM exhibit was horrible. Shall we conclude, because the muse museum exhibits are poor, that evolution has not occurred? I don't think that follows. And Phil also argues that we cannot conceive of a natural process that can produce both diversity and adaptations. It seems to me clear that indeed natural selection can account for adaptations because Phil believes that Hawaiian Drosophila evolved through naturalistic processes. In those 700 some odd species of Drosophila, there are some of the most exquisite adaptations you would ever lay your eyes upon or understand.